Hi, everyone. Welcome to the CSPI podcast. I'm here with Philippe Lemoine. Uh, Philippe, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks. Sure. So uh, today is um, the 22nd of April, uh, 2022. Um, there is a French election coming up. Uh, that's uh, So today's Friday. That's going to be Sunday, uh, April 24th. Um, and this podcast, we're going to release uh, April 25th. Um, and you, you know, you said, you know, we were going to record one in the aftermath of the French election, uh, and then try to release it the day after. And at some point you said to me, um, we don't need to wait for the election. I already know it's going to happen. Uh, so I said, okay, in that case, let's just, let's just record the podcast now. Um, and so here we are. Uh, so people are going to be listening to this in the future and either Philippe is going to be right or he's going to be wrong. Um, and so you, you, you're confident about what's going to happen on Sunday, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty confident. Uh, actually what you said is that, uh, we should wait for the results to know the results to, to record the podcast. And that's, that's why I told you that in that case, we, we could record it right away because yeah, I'm, I'm very confident. You know, she's going to lose. I mean, Le Pen is going to lose. Macron's going to get, is going to be reelected. And she's not only going to lose, but she's going to lose very badly. No, not as badly as last time, of course, but uh, she's going to lose. I'd say she's going to lose by at least 10 points. I I'd be surprised if she got more than... I expect that she's going to get something like between 43 and 44% of the vote. I'd be surprised if she got more than, than 45. Um, but, but she's going to lose. That much is certain. Um, I, I think it's uh, virtually certain she's going to lose by, well... That be that's a bit strong, but I think it's very likely that she's going to lose by at least ten points, and yeah, uh, it could get more, worse than that. You know, like like I said, if I had to bet right now, I'd say uh, she's going to get something between forty three percent and forty four percent of the vote. Yeah, and your prediction is more. I mean, it's not that. I mean, to, as we record this, uh, you know, the polls show something like that. The polls show ten fifteen percent. <laughs> but you started saying it was sure before there was even a runoff, and there were some polls um, right after the first round of the election that showed it within like a few points, right, like three four points or something like that. Um, and so that's when you were say you were saying you know she's going to lose for sure. People can check your Twitter record. So you didn't just start saying you know she's going to lose when you saw the polls. She was down by ten or fifteen, right? Yes, yes. So uh, she, she right now I think the poll average is, shows her at something like forty four percent. But um, you know right before the the, the first round, uh, I think they were within like three to four percent. But even already at the time, I said that she was she was going to lose by at least ten points, and the reason why I said that is because um, I knew that those polls did not reflect, uh, you know, what was going to happen in the second round. There are several reasons for that. Um, one reason is that you know it's basically two elections, and so uh, French voters before the first round they're focusing on the first round and like that you know there are, we don't have a, a Two party systems, two party systems. So we have like we have several parties and candidates, and um, and so people. There are lots of people who eventually are going to vote for Macron, but um, they really don't like Macron. And before the first round, they're focusing on beating Macron or you know getting to the second round or beating Le Pen to get to the second round instead of her. Um, and so you know, if you ask them who's are going to vote for the second round, they're not going to. Again, it's just, it's like a different election. So they're not going to be in the right mind space to, you, you can't really take very seriously their, um, their, um, what would they tell you at this point? I mean, of course, it tells you something, but it doesn't, it's not nearly as, as good as what many people would assume. Uh, and, you know, another reason which is relate, related to that one is that, so what happens is that most French pollsters, uh, they ask people how certain they are, uh, of voting. So, you know, for instance, one of the most prominent ones, it asks them to um, say how certain they are by putting themselves on a 0 to 10 scale. You know, 0 being I'm certain I'm not voting, 10 is I'm absolutely certain I'm going to vote. And then they only keep, they only ask people who said, who answered, who put them at 9, at themselves at 9 or 10. Uh, they only keep those people and they ask those people, but only those people uh, who they plan to vote for in the second round or, you know, in the first round, same thing for first second round um and so what this means is that in effect they only take into account people who, at the moment they're being interrogated are certain they're going to vote in the second round 
But I know that there, uh, you know, I knew that there were a lot of people, especially on the left, who, uh, you know, were like before the the first round was over or right after it was over. A lot of people, especially on the left, if you ask them, you know, suppose that your candidate, because that's what effectively those polls were asking them, if your candidate is not qualified to the second round, are you going to vote for Le Pen or for Macron? And those guys were going to be, they were basically very disappointed. So they were, at, the, at this point, they were not in the right mindset to say, oh, I'm going to vote for Macron, even though that's what they, I knew that's what they, many of them would end up doing. So a lot of them would say, oh, you know, they're still disappointed. A lot of them were saying, I'm not going to vote, you know, if it's, if it's that, if it's Macron against Le Pen, there's no way I'm voting. Because they're pissed off, you know, their candidate lost in this scenario. They don't want to hear about the second round. But of course, that's what they say on Sunday night, you know. But, um, but you know that they're going to calm down, you know, after a few days. And there's going to be like, uh, you know, that's another reason. There's going to be like a heavy propaganda against Le Pen. You know, telling them that she's like the far right candidate, you know, that it will be the end of the republic, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, those people, they go from being like really pissed off because their candidate wasn't qualified. You know, I'm talking especially about Mélenchon voters, who are like the largest bloke of people who could affect the poll. And so I expected that those people who at first said uh, that, that, you know, I expected that part of the reason why Le Pen and Macron were so close uh, in the polls uh when the results for the of the first round were were announced, is because um, a lot of those people who answered the posters told them they were not going to vote, or at least they were not like certain of voting, and so they were not taken into account. But I know I knew that a lot of those people would in fact vote despite what they said on on the night of the first of the first round, and that you know most of those guys are not going to vote. You know this is another thing that you hear a lot of pundits say, which is pure nonsense. A lot of them say, oh, you know, because Mélenchon is a populist, you know, populist. It's it's like an illustration of how empty this, this term often is, you know. Like Mélenchon is a populist, Le Pen is a populist. Of course, a lot of them are going to vote for Le Pen in the second round, uh, now that um, Mélenchon is not qualified. But this is nonsense because, you know, uh, uh, most, not all of them, but most of Mélenchon voters are highly ide ideological people and they're highly, they're very left-wing. They're not, you know, they're not going to vote for the far right candidate, especially not for someone whose name is Le Pen, you know, which is a name that has almost magical power in ma magical powers in France now, especially on the left. It's yeah. like the, the, the devil, you know. So, so of course, a lot of those guys were going to vote and they were going to vote. Most of them were going to vote for against Mac against Le Pen, you know, not for Macron, but against Le Pen. I mean, in practice, that means for Macron. So I expected that for all those reasons and also because of the propaganda and everything, because you know, the, the media held back on a lot of stuff they had on, on Le Pen because they knew it would be more useful during between the, the two rounds. And so, you know, I expected that for all those reasons, she would go down in the polls as the second round would approach, which is exactly what happened. And now I'm expecting that, yeah, she's going to end up with like, I don't know, 33, 44%, something like that. Yeah. You know, yeah, I was so I watch French politics, and I just I'm interested in the differences between Amer uh, you know with American politics because that's what I know. So in the U.S., when the uh, when the media is just going to gang up on a politician, there there are antibodies. Um, you know, like it's sort of baked into the system that the media you know is going to hate Republicans and it's going to be all but cheering for Democrats. And like nobody says that the Republicans are going to lose in twenty twenty four because that's what's going to happen because we already it's baked into the model. Like we know it's going to happen. And but anyways, the Republicans are still going to have a chance um, because partly the electoral college, but partly because public opinion is so polarized and a lot of people don't listen to the uh, uh, to the media. Um, but France, it seems like, no, it seems like there is there, is, you know, it's not, if anything, it's, it's, you know, I don't know if there's more trust or less trust in the media, but there's, it's, there's less polarization. Is, is that right? Yeah, exactly. I think, I think that's the explanation here. Uh, there's definitely not more trust in the media. I mean, trust in the media in France is extremely low. I don't have the figures in, in you know, in mind right now. So I can't tell you off the top of my head if it's lower than the U.S. But it's so low. I know it's so low in France. It's like something like 20% that uh, it's similar to the U.S. and possibly even lower trust in the media. Uh, but the difference is polarization and polarization combined. That's another key difference that interact with this combined with uh, the fact that in the U.S. you have a two-party system. Look, you know, 
the media can bash on Trump or whoever the uh, Republican candidate is as much as they can. At the end of the day, you still have the basic fact of polarization. You, you still have two sides. And people are on the right side in both sense of the term, if you ask me. <laughs> um, uh, you know, they have no choice. You know, like if, if they want to beat the left, they have only one serious candidate. And this is not the case in France. So, you know, um, if one candidate gets bashed in the head, like incessantly by the media, uh, they have other options that may not be, you know, because the, the media, they can only focus on, you know, they focus on Zemmour before the first, you know, before the, the first round, which is one of the reasons uh, Le Pen was, was able to sail like relatively without any trouble, you know, to the second round. The fact, the fact that we don't have a two party system, it's one of the many examples of the difference differences it creates. Uh, it leads to a lot of, you know, uh, it leads to a lot of difference that so you, you can't expect the same thing. So, you know, the media, um, the media has more room uh, to, uh, to affect the election, at least in that sense, in France, even though trust in the media is very low. Because, you know, look, um, people may not trust the media, but if you're a left-wing guy and you're thinking of not voting, you know, so you're, you're a Mélenchon voter, so your guy was uh, eliminated in the first round, and you're thinking what, what to do in the second round, and without the media, you, you, even if you don't trust the media, you're still going to be reminded all the time, you know, they're going to reactivate your, as it were, immune defense against the national front, because this is something that, that's been bashing through your head for like decades. And, and you're going to be exposed to this, whether or not you trust the media. And this is going to affect your behavior, your electoral behavior. Uh, so a lot of those guys without this, without those constant reminders, they may have actually not voted. In fact, some some are not. You know, a lot of them are are not going to going to vote. You know, the second round, just not as many as as those who said they would not in the you know two weeks ago. But um, you, you know, you they may have not voted, or they may even have voted it for Le Pen. You know, in greater number. Which, frankly, at least as far as the economic policy is concerned, but that's what those guys are supposed to care the most about. Of course, it's not, but um, that's what they, that's their self representation. Is that they care mostly about economic policy? That's that's the rational thing to do for them because Le Pen's economic policies are much closer to Mélenchon's than than Macron's. But um, but you know, even though they don't trust the media, in fact, they are exposed to this incessant reminder that Le Pen is like Le Pen's election will be terrible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they're doing the you know, but it doesn't even matter. I mean, you know, look, even if those guys, if all of them abstain, you know, didn't vote in the second round. Le Pen would still lose. That's the thing. You know, it's like, why are people even talking about this? Like, this thing is like, uh, there is any remote, there's a, even a remote possibility that she might win. She can't. I mean, you know, he, he won like by, he has, he had something like five, he was five points ahead of her in the first round. So, you know, you have Zemmour that got 7%. Um, you know, even if he gets all of those Zemmour votes, uh, she'd still only be like two points ahead of him. And, you know, there's plenty of room in the rest for him to get, like, way more than those two points. So, you know, just based on the result, look, the, when, when we got the results of the, of the first round, um, what I did is that I, I did this little exercise where I made this little script we, where, you know, or you can do a spreadsheet, same thing, um, where I made a, a hypothesis, you know, I, the script calculates the, the score of uh, Le Pen and Macron the second round. Based on what hypothesis you make about who among the elect the voters in the first round for each candidate, what they're going to do, you know, which pro proportion, what proportion for each candidate is going to not vote in the second round, uh, among those who vote, which proportion is going to vote for Le Pen, which proportion is going to vote for uh, Macron, and also made some assumption about like people who didn't vote in the first round but were going to vote in the second round. Uh, and, and, you know, when you look at this, if you made like, if you made reasonable, but still very, in my opinion, very, very favorable hypothesis, uh, f favorable for, for Le Pen, that is, uh, the answer is that, so keeping everything else equal, making like pretty optimistic assumptions, you know, something like a Pécresse voter, half of them would vote for Macron, where in fact it's going to be much more than half, you know, so that's, that's what I mean when I say it was pretty favorable to Le Pen. Um, when you make all those favorable assumptions, um, and then you look at 
what it would take, what elect, what Mélenchon voters would need to do for her to win. What I found is that it would have to be the case that twice as many Mélenchon voters would vote for her than um, uh, than for Le Pen, uh, than for Macron, which you know is never going to happen. Like nobody who knows anything about French politics, which apparently is like not a lot of pundits, even in France, that's the most amazing thing. Uh, you know, it's never going to happen. Like it's just. You know, you can okay. quibble about so we've the got you on the, We've got you on the record. Uh, what percentage does, yeah. uh, chance does Le Pen have? Is it 5%, 10%, 1%? What do you say? Oh, she has like, you know, I, I'd say something like less than 1%. <laughs> okay. So you're going to, you, people will see, people will see on, on Monday whether. Yeah, yeah, you know, no, you're, they're gonna, you're going to. You know, I mean, I, I'm really not worried. It's uh, because people make this, you know, that's the thing. When I say that, people tell me all the time, uh, oh, you know, I, I know a lot, a lot of people say that about Trump in 2016, and, you know, we know what happened. But look, first of all, I didn't say that in 2016. You know, I, I thought it wasn't the most likely option. Um, and But I, I remember I wrote this long, I, I didn't have a blog yet, but I wrote this long Facebook post, where which was about, like, um, election prediction models. And I was arguing that, you know, because there was this guy, I forgot his name, but the guy was running the model for the, the Princeton Consortium. Um, uh, Asian guy, I forgot his name. Uh, anyway, um, uh, Wang, his name is Sam Wang. And this guy said that if Trump won, he would eat a bug on national TV. And, and you know, I argued in that post that, um, you know, his models was wrong because he didn't take seriously enough into account, you know, uh, a polling error, the possibility of a polling error, the fact that they were originally correlated, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I said, you know, when you're not careful, you end up you know, eating a bug on live TV. And, you know, that's what happened. So, but in this he's, he's case, independent errors. He's assuming that if Florida, the poll is off in Florida, it tells you nothing about Wisconsin, which is nonsense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he wasn't quite assuming like that. Yeah, he wasn't quite assuming that, but he was making an error of that sort, you know, like he didn't take that seriously into account seriously enough. And, but, but you know, he thought they were uh, correlated, but he, did, well, he wasn't taking the correlation seriously enough. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And so, um, you know, but in France, it's completely different because we, we don't, for one thing, this big thing is we don't have an electoral college. So, you know, you know, because Trump won in, I mean, Trump lost the popular vote pretty handsomely, actually, in 2016. He won because, because he carried three states by, you know, a few thousand votes, you know, a few dozen thousand votes. Um, and that's it. That's why he lost. That's why he won. But we, we don't have that in France. You know, it's like, the, but the polls, polls were, but the, poll, and the polls were only a few points. Uh, the, the 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 polling error would be much bigger than Trump in 2016. Uh, Trump in 2020 almost did the same thing um, with the electoral college. Although here, I think the I think that it was six or seven. That was the difference between Biden and Trump. And then Biden Trump came much closer. So maybe it was a polling error of like three or four or something like that. You have a popular vote here, and you have 10, 15. <clears> you need a 10, 15 percent. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's that's the thing, you know, like we don't have the electoral college and the margin in the polls is actually much larger. And also uh, at presidential elections, French pollsters have actually a, a significantly better track record than um, uh, than American, American pollsters. So, you know, you put all that together, you realize that this comparison that people make all the time with Trump in 2016 and you're right, you know, you to some extent you could even make that um, comparison with Trump in 2020, even though he didn't win because he was much closer than a lot of people, including myself, I have to say, expected. Um, but you know, it's it's a very flawed comparison. That's not going to happen. You know, like you know, as, as people are listening to this, I can say very confidently that Le Pen has been trounced. You know, like and I know <laughs> I'm not going to look like a fool. You know, in two days. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah. very different. Well, people people different. just misremember 2016. They they don't understand. They think the polls were a lot closer than they were, or they were a lot further apart. I mean, they thought that tr they they were acting as if Hillary was up by 10 or 15 percent or something, and that's not what the polls said. So 2016, I mean, people are misremembering it. So if if Hillary well, it looked like was winning by 15 percent or 10 percent, you know, that would have and then lost. That would have been a completely different thing. So I checked the prediction markets on predicted. They have uh, Macron at 94. They have Le Pen at six. Uh, so you're saying that's, you know, you buy Macron right now and you make, you know, like, uh, it's like you could make like a $30, $40 profit uh, on this on, on predicted because uh, of the $850 limit on the contract. You make six. Yeah. Uh, like you, 50 you know, I was going to, I was going to, I got, 
you know, I, I made a big mistake because uh, right before the first round, there were some um, uh, betting websites in the UK because, we, you know, political bets are illegal in France. Um, but, you know, I have some friends who offered to uh, bet for me in the UK, you know. On my wow. Behalf. So in early um, April, Le, Pe Le Pen on predicted was at 28 uh, percent. Yeah, yeah. That's the month. thing, you know, and, and like uh, right before, like two days before the, f the first round, uh, she was at three to one on some of those uh, British political betting sites. And I, I miscalculated because. I almost took the bets then, and I was gonna bet like two thousand dollars or something because I, you know, was gonna make or probably three thousand, so I could get like a, I could, I could have gotten one thousand bucks, like of like the easiest money ever, but uh, I got screwed because um, I was expecting that it would get even worse on the night of the results because I didn't think that Macron would do as well uh, on in the first round. He wasn't as high in the polls in the first round, and and so what I was expecting is that because of the mechanism I described before, you know, Mélenchon voters will be even more disappointed on the night of the results because, you know, their candidates just lost and it was pretty close. And, you know, so I knew it was going to be pretty close. In fact, I felt that Mélenchon actually had a chance to, to get to the second round and he was very close. He was, Could he was have won? Close. Could Mélenchon have won in the second round? No, he would never have won either. Yeah. No, he, he had no chance either. But he could have, he could have been in the second round. And in fact, that would have been my preferred results for complicated reasons. But uh, that we, you know, we can talk about this later, maybe. But yeah, so. um, but but you know, I was expecting that because they'd be so disappointed, even more of them would say they wouldn't vote in the second round, and so uh, Le Pen would go even a little bit higher, and then you know the 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 betting odds would get better. But in fact, uh, you know that uh, Macron Macron was so high in the first round that this didn't happen. You know, okay, so we'll we'll see what happens uh, Sunday. You you heard it here, folks. Uh, first, folks, uh, it's going to be back around. Um, the uh, so uh, going back to sort of the first round and what happened to Zamor. You wrote something uh, to uh, for us about Zamor. You seemed to think there was a good chance he would uh, overtake Le Pen, uh, and then pretty early, I remember talking to you. You said uh, probably you know he wouldn't. You be after the, I think after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, you started to become confident that, that wouldn't happen. Uh, so can you explain sort of your take on why you were optimistic about some more? And then what do you think happened? So my take hasn't changed all that, you know, since what I wrote in December for CSPI. Basically, the argument I made at the time was that uh, strictly speaking, in theory, it was a competition between three people on the right, you know, Pécresse, uh, Zemmour, and Le Pen. But I argued that Pécresse would, would collapse, you know, which... Mm. So and Pécresse is the... Right. They call them the Republicans, right? That's the mainstream right-wing yes. party. Yeah, that, that's the mainstream right. You know, that's Sarkozy's former party. Used to be the one of the two parties that uh, ruled, you know, France for, like, decades, uh, alternatively. And um, and so, so this did happen, you know, with, but that was... That was unsurprising. And then I said, so it's going to be between, so the, the, the spot in the second round is going to be between, it's going to be a competition between uh, Le Pen and, uh, and Zemmour. And, uh, and so uh, I thought that, uh, you know, I thought that Zemmour had about, at that point, I said in the paper, he had like maybe a 50% chance of getting in the sec to the second round, which I still think was actually a pretty good estimate. And, uh, but already at the time I said that, of course, I didn't think about the, the, the war in Ukraine at the time, but I said that, um, the question, the real question, you know, if you want to know whether this was going to happen or not, was, um, whether low information voters who tend to decide late in the campaign, you know, the last few weeks of the campaigns were going to be, because a lot of those guys at this point were saying, we're going to vote for, to the extent they were saying anything, they were saying, uh, we were going to vote for, we're going to vote for Le Pen. But my interpretation was that, my hypothesis was that they're saying that because Le Pen, they know, you know, they have been exposed to Le Pen. They hadn't been exposed to Zemmour because again, those are low information voters. They don't follow politics very closely. So they don't listen to, they wouldn't listen to candidates. Although the, Zemmour, the was a, Zemmour was a pretty important figure, is he on the fame of life? So he had a he had a show, he had a book. I mean, is he like a, a yeah, famous? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he, well, yeah, but you have to understand that um, 
He was an important figure for people who were obsessed with politics and the so culture. So, like, war. is he as famous as Tucker Carlson is in the U.S.? Is that a good comparison? Uh, he, he is. I guess he'll be a good comparison if Tucker Carlson ran for election. I'm sure that you know, even though polit- politics nerds like us, of course, uh, you know, are very familiar with him, but uh, most of the, you know, most of the GOP uh, voters in the primaries. You know they wouldn't know him. You know, I mean, they, like uh, you know, Fox Fox News. It's like it's it's not that many people. It's like I think. Yeah, but the, like the primary more, the, the, the primary thing confuses it. But the primary voters are a small uh, percentage of the population. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, but even even they, you know, even they are, uh, you know, even though they're much more, they're much higher information voters than the typical voter. Uh, but even they. A lot of them, I, I bet, wouldn't know much about Tucker Carlson and where it stands, what he stands for, on, on what he should. I'd be, I'd be surprised. For, maybe for you, right? For the uh, for the general public, for the Republican primary, but it's a really, really small. The turnouts for uh, primary voters is pretty small. Fox News is big, but but anyways, yeah. So okay, so yeah, I but, think but, of Tucker but, you know, Carlson. So in, in 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 France, at least, um, um, it's not like that. In, right? in France, at least, you know, like uh, in any case, we don't have this. Is not a primary, you know. Although you could argue that the first round is kind of like a big primary, but that's not uh-huh. a good comparison in many ways. Of course, but much uh, um, so um, a lot of those guys, uh, even in back in December, again, you know, if you're a if you're a politics nerd, of course, you knew them or was, uh, you know, if you if you listen to political interviews and political, if you watch political shows and all that stuff. You knew who Zemmour was, or you know, cultural shows because he was also a cultural critic for very long. You knew who Zemmour was. You had a, probably a pretty good idea because you're probably the kind of guy who listens to political interview interviews, and so you have pr- pretty good idea of where he's, what he stands for, you know, on what issue, where he's on what issues, etc. But uh, low information voters, like I bet most of them uh, had no idea, you know. So like. Um, uh, the, for instance, I remember having this conversation with my parents. They were telling me about a conversation they had with like someone in their village, um, you know, the friend of them in their village, and they were asking her about Zemu. And basically, her, the woman's answer was something like, "Oh yeah, he's the guy who was on the TV." You know, like that's that's about the extent of what she knew about Zemu. And so I think this is people always vastly overestimate. I, I'm sorry, I'm talking about political nerds. Vastly overestimate. How much people know about politics? They almost know nothing about politics, and so a, a big chunk of the of the electorate only gets some sense, some vague sense of what each candidate stands for in the last few weeks of the campaign. And so already at the time, what I was saying, the question is: right now, those guys are saying Le Pen because that's who they know. The question is: once they're exposed to Zemmour. Because they start caring about the campaign, following the campaign the last few weeks, are they actually go- are enough of them going to be seduced by him, and so they're going to be um, you know to to put him ahead of of Le Pen and he's going to make it to the second round, or are they going to be put off by his more ideological or intellectual style and and stick with Le Pen? That's what I said in December, and I still think that this was right. But no, the war made complicated the thing. Is there one hypothesis is that what happened is that we have the answer to this question, and the answer is that those low information voters who are predisposed to vote for a right wing candidate, anti immigration candidate, uh, they didn't like Zemo's more like ideological, intellectual style of politics, and so right. they stuck with yeah. Le Pen. And and that's possible, you know. I'm not saying, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that were true. Even in December, I said that th- that was a big question. That was the big question. But the war means there is another hypothesis, in my in my opinion. The other hypothesis is this. Um, and, you know, that's also why, as you said, as soon as the war started, I was like, okay, it's over for Zemo, basically. Um, and the reason we why I thought that everything. is that the war shut down the campaign. There was no campaign after the war. So those last few weeks, which were going to be the weeks during which those low information voters would get exposed to Zemmour and possibly uh, switch from Le Pen to him. This didn't happen. You know, there was no way it could happen because there was no campaign because of the war. Because the war just shut down everything. So, so you know, I don't know which, you know, they're not, of course, they're not inconsistent. Both hypotheses could be true to some degree. But uh, the bottom line is we don't know 
what would happen because what happened is that because you know because there was no campaign those guys they stuck with who they knew and who they knew was Le Pen you know and it's the same thing that happened you know during COVID you know whenever there was a you know when there was a big COVID COVID wave, COVID wave you know in January um, there was no campaign for the same reason because the the media were obsessed with the with COVID you know and so they were not talking about the campaign and so again you know that was something where can new candidates or less well-known candidates didn't have a chance to get, you know, to get a hearing from uh, people who so far hadn't followed, you know, the campaign. And so that, that was bad for Zemmour. But after this ended, because, you know, when the war started, Zemmour had been rising steadily in the polls and gaining on Le Pen. And he was only at three points behind her. And, you know, I think, again, I don't know what would happen. You know, it may be that uh, so, uh, when those... Uh, it yeah. may be that when those low information voters were exposed to to him, they would still have preferred. They wouldn't have liked it. They would have preferred Le Pen uh, uh, style and stuck with her. But but maybe not. You know, so we'll never know. But uh, yeah, the, the war made sure of that. So I don't have the, the polling data in front of me, but I have the the betting markets on predicted. So on February twenty uh, fourth was the Russian invasion. Uh, was it twenty fourth or twenty? I think February twenty fourth. Uh, anyways, they were uh, in the markets. They were. Uh, they were about tied. So Zamor was at eight, uh, eight percent, eight seven or eight per seven percent, and Le Pen was at five, uh, five percent. Uh, so they were, you know, Zamor they thought was a little bit higher, uh, and then the market, um, and then Zamor stays actually, uh, and then I think Zamor, yeah, Zamor falls like exactly that day. Right yeah, the, the, the reason is up. because I think the reason why they put him higher, even though he was actually behind in the polls. Is that uh, if you look at the dynamic, he was he was rising, he was gaining steadily on her, whereas she was stagnating or even falling a little bit. And didn't so, he, you, uh, didn't he start stagnating though a little bit before that? Well, didn't he? Didn't he start stagnating before the war? So what happened is that he first rose in the in the fall, and then uh, at the end, you know, sometime in November, he started falling. And then he fell, he fell, and then he, he was able to stabilize the fall in early January, but then was still much lower than, than Le Pen for a while. Uh, like I said, there was a big COVID wave, so there wasn't much he could do to, because there was no campaign, so there wasn't much he could do to gain uh, uh, gain honor. But then, you know, when this was over, in February, he started steadily rising. And I think that's why, you know, they were looking at the dynamic and were like, okay, those things generally have inertia. So if he's rising now, they were assuming he was going to continue mm, to rise. Okay. Frankly, he's also yeah. So he rose. I'm looking at the. Um, I'm looking at yeah at the poll link. So he it had stabilized before the uh, invasion, uh, the Russian invasion. He was slight. Yeah, he had he had reached some peak of like 15 percent or something. It went down. It stabilized. Started rising a little bit, and then the uh, the invasion comes, and he actually he rises. Uh, he rises into March. Actually, it has it does have him rising after the uh, invasion um, in the polls, but he doesn't uh, he doesn't catch up to Le Pen. Le Pen stays uh, ahead of him. Um, yeah, I think uh, you know uh, I think the idea that he you know people they talk about ideas and they talk about you know the cultural stuff and uh, you know I think people sometimes don't, really don't understand the low information voter. Um, let me tell you, I think about it sort of like this, and let me let me see what what you think of this, like. You know, like it, when I was growing up, like people that I knew, they like had parents who didn't go to college and they were like below average students and they would often go to like McDonald's. They would go to like a chain restaurant. And then when I got older and I started meeting people who were, you know, more intellectual, more educated, like they would never go to a chain restaurant, right? Or very rarely, right? Like, so it seemed like that the lower classes had a sort of kind of brand loyalty. Um, and in politics, you know, I think that that's sort of Le Pen uh, for the right wing voter. Uh, and Zamor is like a new fancy restaurant, which is going to be like, you know, a very appealing to um, a more, you know, a more intellectual kind of right wing voter, but not necessarily the masses who, you know, want to eat McDonald's and, and are happy with that. Uh, does that, does that sort of, does that sort of analogy make sense to you? Yeah. I mean, basically that's, I think that's another way of saying, you, you know, that, uh, you know, when you go back to the hypothesis I mentioned earlier is that the first hypothesis is true. and basically. Uh, the reason why Zemo failed is that those low information voters, they didn't like his, you know, more intellectual style of politics and they prefer, you but know. There's two uh, things. There's the intellectual style and then there's the novelty, right? They might not like novelty yeah, and they yeah, might yeah, not yeah. like intellectual style. 
Yeah, don't, you know, don't, I mean, there are definitely some voters who are uh, very loyal who feel like. Le Pen is very strongly that Le Pen is is speaking for people like her, you know, kind of what happened with, with Trump in the U.S., you know, and so they have some personal li- loyalty to her, and that's certainly true. Um, but I think those people, uh, well, you know, it depends. I mean, I, I was going to say they tend to be like not necessarily as low information voters as the ones we're talking about, but there are actually some. It depends exactly about what you mean by uh, low information voters, but. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, th- there was some of that for sure. Um, I don't think it would have been enough if the mass of them, you know, the novelty factor and, you know, loyalty to what you knew, I don't think it would have been enough if they hadn't, if they weren't put off by Zemo's more, you know, maybe intellectual style. So, the, you know, I'm not saying they were actually, like I said, it's an open question whether this was really one of what determined, you know, the, the thing. Because the war did change everything, not because it, it put an end to the campaign, but also because uh, it puts the the question, the issue of purchasing power, you know, and, and money back as the the main you know issue, because of like gas increasing, you know, energy, the price of in- energy increasing, you know, for a lot of like for low income voters, that's a big deal because that's a big chunk of their budget. So uh, it became very difficult, you know, when people when people are facing like huge increase in their um, energy expenditures. Although it didn't really happen in France because the government, like, basically, uh, you know, poured a lot of money to block the price and, you know, prevent people from um, having to pay for the increase. But, you know, that was a worry, you know. And, and, you know, we still felt inflation. It wasn't as bad as in most uh, European countries, but it's still pretty bad and people could feel it. So um, for low information, we tend to be low income uh, voters. This was, this became, you know, for most people, in fact, this became the main issue. And when you care about that sort of things, you know, when you have to worry about paying your gas bill, you know, in the next month, uh, you're going to care less about stuff like immigration or, you know, the future, cult, you know, the, the future of the cultural, the French cultural makeup, that sort of issues. They're not the kind of issues where that it's easy to mobilize people on. When well, they yeah, were, but that's well, the things. economic basis of French politics, uh, lower class French politics, interesting because I was watching a little bit of the uh, the, uh, the yellow vests. Um, yeah, in the U.S., if you have a working class protest, um, it's you know it's it's not about economic. It's like maybe there is, but it, you know a little bit, but it's actually not. I mean, it's always sort of like, you know, the, uh, you had the tea party right around 2010 where these people were protesting, you know, against big government, um, and against, you know, government spending. Um, and so like in the U S like a lower class, like uh, white protest in favor of like economic liberalism, um, you know, that was also like, uh, but it was not about, uh, cultural issues is sort of unthinkable. So the yellow vest seemed to be something that like, it wasn't really about culture. It actually was about the economics. Um, and that doesn't really exist in the U S I mean, am I, am I understanding the yellow vest correctly? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. It's very, it's very tricky. It's a very weird, the, the yellow vest, it was like a, like the truckers very, protest in the U.S. and Canada, and that was about vaccine mandates, and that was connected to like this whole other stuff about the COVID thing. It was like culturally like a right wing thing, right? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the yellow vest was a very weird political phenomenon. It's very difficult to compare it to anything else. It started as an economic issue. It started because people were protesting, but even that was arguably arguably not the real reason because it started as a protest against a tax hike on, you know, carbon tax, basically, on, on the fuel, you know, gasoline. But the tax was minuscule. And, you know, even for low-income voters, it did not make any difference with their budget, I can tell you this. Like, it was really absolutely nothing. So it, it's not because this tax actually made a, a meaningful difference to those people's purchasing power or anything. Yeah, it's but, always um, yeah. It, it was more of a right-wing... Uh, it was more in the tradition of French Jacquerie, you know, where, or, you know, in the, which in the modern era is more about a protest against taxes in general. But, uh, so in that sense, it was a bit like, uh, the, the Tea Party, but without all the strong, like, libertarian ideology, which the Tea Party had, of course. Um, so 
it was like, you know, done with the taxes, basically. That was the initial impetus. That was the initial impetus. But then, then things changed and it was transformed. Um, you know, then basically it was kind of a revolt against Macron himself and what Macron represents, you know, the kind of, um, um, arrogant elites, you know, look down on those people. At least that's how they perceive it. Um, and so they were, um, and you know, the demand, you know, there was started to be, to be demands for more democracy. You know, one of the things they were asking for, uh, not right away, but pretty soon was, uh, something similar to a popular initiative in, in Switzerland, you know, where, uh, the people itself can trigger a referendum. Um, and then, you know, eventually it was, um, Infiltrated by left wing militants, and then it, it became more, you know, they started to have like, but then the, the, the movement filled out, you know, but, but, you know, at its peak, it was a weird combination. And then, uh, like I said, the, the initial impetus was a uh, kind of protest against taxes, but not very ideological, you know, not with like a strong, coherent ideology, uh, like the Tea Party, you know, had. Um, and then, you know, it very quickly morphed into, I mean, you know, this stayed. But then it morphed into something about a demand for dignity, you know, for from people who felt like they had been um, ignored and like uh, and were not properly taken into consideration. And that's where the the stuff about di direct democracy also, you know, it, it kind of latched onto this. So it was a very, it's a very weird, uh, it's a very, it was a very weird political phenomenon. It's very difficult to find any adequate comparison. Uh, elsewhere, or even in France, before that. Yeah. So what? Do you, so what do you see? So the the the, the besides the electoral um, uh, sort of strengths and weaknesses, what are the um, you know what were the ideological differences? But and the, you know, and talk, I guess you could talk about the. Let's talk about the ideology first. We could also talk about sort of the class differences. Uh, what are the ideological differences between some more of Le Pen in the last election? Uh, Le Pen, in many ways, was well. You you can argue. It, I don't think they. He was that much more radical and stuff like immigration, but I think that he was more willing to be to be open about it, to be explicit. So he would say, more things. Was, "I mean, honestly, more was explicit." Yeah, yes, yeah, they more said things that, um, like a few years ago, were the kind of thing that you would only hear like weird, anonymous people with like anime profile pictures on Twitter say. Um, you know, he said things. I mean, I think in some cases it was actually a mistake, but um, because he, what's the most, what's the most extreme like, things he would say? Well, he said, for instance, he would create a minister of remigration, which means sending back not just stopping immigration, but actually actively sending back immigrants back <laughs> to their country, which which for him was only about sending the immigrants themselves. But the historically, the word, the expression had been used to send even the descendants of immigrants who were, uh, you know, were and that French. Wasn't, you know, that wasn't French his policy. Like, he was just not. He was not sensitive. No, no, that wasn't that. his policy. But I'm saying, just he used a word that would that had this connotation, and he yeah. used that, you know, like, uh, and um, but I think that was something he did at the end. You know, it was kind of like a somewhat desperate attempt to uh, uh, keep keep his base. You know. Um, yeah, and, and Le Pen uh, would talk about him as a more being a sexist, right? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, in, in you know, he wrote that book. So Zemmour had a lot of baggage. I mean, we we knew that when 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 it started, you know, like everybody understood that this was going to be a problem for him. Woman was going to be that's another thing I mentioned in my essay that woman was going to be a big problem for him. So one of the reasons is that he wrote that book in two thousand six called The First Sex, which was a reference. Uh, the, an amusing reference to uh, De Beauvoir's famous book, The Second Sex, and um, mm. where he, you know, he says a lot of like extremely based stuff about women. And obviously, you can if you if you if you quote some of the passages uh, out of context, and even sometimes with the context, but even more when it's you know, which is of course what people usually did out of context, uh, you can get stuff that will really, really rub a lot of women the wrong way. And of course it did. And so, and again, that's another place, that's another place where the difference of the US is actually relevant here. And the fact that we don't have a, a two party system. And that's something I also explained in the essay at the time is that look, 
uh, this was similar to Trump, although for different reasons, you know. Trump, you know, um, Trump turned off a lot of women because of his sexism. And but the thing is that you have a two party system and a highly polarized so, so, you know yeah. society Nothing in the matters, US. Right. Nothing matters. So look, yeah. I mean, if you're a Republican woman, okay, you may hate, or you know, even a Republican man who is repulsed by by Trump sexism. Well, you may be repulsed by Trump sexism, but you're not going to be as repulsed by sexism as you're going to be by uh, you know the Democrat left wing policies. So you're still going to vote for uh, you're still going to vote for uh, for Trump, but and I said, did he, yes, did he, he run on did he run on any uh, anti feminist policies, or was it just about the old book? Um, I don't think you know. I don't think as when you look at policies, I can't remember any policy that was particularly no. I, I don't think so. I don't have anything in mind. Like, you know, like he didn't propose to uh, put you know create restrictions on uh, on abortion or. Um, to limit access to birth control, any of that stuff, you know, he didn't do any of that stuff. No, 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 the major kind of Le Pen doesn't do that either, right? No, Le Pen doesn't do that either. And is there anything? You know, is there any kind of? Was there any kind of talk about? So the uh, in the in the the recent uh, winner of the South Korean election was talking about like eliminating the Ministry of like uh, Gender Equality or something in South Korea. Was that, yeah? Is, so is he, I mean, yeah, he did, but I think Le Pen may actually propose that too. I'm not sure. Okay, so there wasn't uh, you know, any policy low, difference here. We, we have a law in France saying that mandating that uh, political parties have to present uh, an equal number of men and women for the deputation for legislative elections. Ah, and you know they, they they're not forced to do it, but if they don't, they have to pay a fine. And uh, yeah, so I was looking. I was looking at female representation in parliament, and I was surprised that France went from ten percent in the late nineteen nineties to like thirty eight percent today. Uh, so it looks like that law, whatever. Do when, you know when that law came into effect? Uh, it must have been in 1999, I think, or 1997. I mean, it was under Jospin, so sometime between 1997 and uh, 2002, I think. Okay, so I didn't know France. So France, so yeah, I didn't know they had gender for the sex affirmative action in France because uh, they're they're uh, low on. We, we do we do for elections, but um, for a very long time. It didn't really matter because basically political parties would pay the fine rather than actually do it. Uh, so, you know, it didn't make much of a difference. So, you know, or they would put the woman in districts where they had no chance, basically. Um, so, you know, they'd find ways to get around the law. Or, you know, some in some cases, not even get around it, but just pay the fine. Uh, I, I'm not sure, you know. I mean, I'm not saying probably the law had some effect, but honestly, uh, I'm not... You know, I don't know how much was the law and how much was just a general evolution of society, uh, you know, irrespective, you know, independently of the law. Yeah. So America, we have we have affirmative action in everything except elections, uh, where basically you can have not a lot of women in in in, uh, in uh, Congress. Uh, but, you know, every other hiring decision does take sex and, of course, race uh, into account. Uh, so that's the so. Yes. OK. So that's like the cultural issues. It, it sounds like there's not that much except that you know, stylistically. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it, it, was, it was primarily a stylistic difference. And, and Le Pen uh, is very left. I mean, very left. I was just checking her thing on that. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. No, that, the economy left-wing. is the exception. You know, on, 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 I was talking, you know, on, on cultural issues, on immigration, it was primarily a, a stylistic difference. On the economy, it's different. On the economy, Zemmour's strategy, which, you know, was actually the right strategy, was to be very moderate to appeal to uh, Republican voters, you know, people who voted for Sarkozy, Fillon, and like, uh, you know, the party of Pécresse was running this time, uh, because those guys tend to be, you know, so that goes, now we can talk maybe a little bit about the class issues, you know, the class yeah, divisions, the, the and how map onto the, the political um, uh, terrain here. Um, so um, basically, um, uh, Republican voters tend to be older and better off financially. So those guys, they're really scared. That's one of the reasons uh, Le Pen does so poorly among old voters. You know, the reason she's going to lose is because of old voters. And the reason why she's going to not only lose, but lose very badly is because of old voters. Because her, her scores are really bad among old voters. Yeah, yeah. And this and is so different the from the Anglo world, where the, the Anglo yeah, yeah, world, exactly, exactly. the yeah, it's younger very different. are always left wing. 
like in in the US, you have this very steep, uh, uh, but in the opposite direction, uh, age gradients where. Uh, for Trump, for instance, like the, as you get older, you're much more likely to vote for him. And you know, young people among young people, he does terrible scores. And Le Pen, it's exactly the opposite. And this is not a new thing. This has been going on for a while. And one of the reasons is because uh, they're scared that our policies, and you know, we have good reasons. If you ask me, uh, that our policies would be inflationary, so they'd lose their savings. Um, they're scared that, um, which is you know related to this, that we'd be we'd leave, we'd be leaving the the euro, the, you know the EU and the euro, the euro currency, uh, which would create a lot of inflation and would create a lot of instability. And you know, all people are scared of this, especially you know uh, pensioners. You know, are not sure that uh, you know they fear that maybe their pensions would not be uh, would not track inflation. Um, uh, that that would be a way to uh, uh, erode their purchasing power, so they're really scared of that stuff, and that's one of the reasons why uh, they don't vote for her, and, and why she lost, or she's gonna lose, um, why she lost for people who are listening, um, and um, but uh, you know that's not the only reason, but that's, that's definitely a reason. So Zemmour, what he was trying to do, he was trying to steal the Republican voters. He was trying to get enough of each side on each side, you know. Which wasn't easy, you know, because there are very different voters at this point. Uh, you have like people who vote for Le Pen, like education and income are very good predictors of voting for Le Pen, you know. And so low education, low income people massively vote for Le Pen, while uh, even right wing, older, uh, more better off uh, p uh, voters, they don't vote for her. They vote for the Republican or for Macron. And, um, and so what Zemmour was trying to do was um, to get enough of each group to get to the second round. And so one part of his strategy to do that uh, was not to um, not to be revol revolutionary when it came to uh, when it came to uh, economic policy. So he basically took his economic policy. His economic policy was very uh, standard. You know, it was like more like standard issue. Uh, Republican economic policy because he didn't want to scare off those people and his bet was that there would be enough voters among the Le Pen electorate who cared primarily about immigration that even if he didn't have this kind of economic policy he would still vote for him which you know again I think this was a right calculation to be honest like I, I think uh, I'm not saying it was it was necessarily going to work in fact it didn't work but you know we don't know if that's because of the war or not that's the issue but uh, that that made sense, you know. Strategically, it made perfect sense uh, in my opinion. The, isn't the polling the polling on immigration is much more um, right wing, it seems, than you would guess from how Le Pen and Zamor do in elections, right? Um, I, you know, there's uh, really hostility to immigration and public opinion, but it doesn't it doesn't see it seems the issue underperforms in elections is that right and why do you think that is yes 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 yeah no it's no it's um you know french the french public opinion has been for years i mean in fact for decades like very strongly opposed to immigration and you're right that this is not reflected in the per the electoral performance of le pen you know in the past and no both le pen and zemmour uh, but look, that's because it's not the only, I, you know, I was going to say that's what, what many people say. And, you know, certainly there's some truth to this is, is that immigration, although it is important and people and most people in France are strongly opposed to it, um, is not the only issue. People care about other stuff like the economy, etc. And I agree, you know, this is true. This is part of the explanation, but I don't think it's the main explanation. The main explanation, in my opinion, is because people are not ideologues. People don't vote based on ideology primarily. Primarily, people vote based on uh, what social groups they more strongly, most strongly identify with, and what perception, what's the perception of the different candidates in those social groups. So in what, other is, words, what, Macron, what does Macron represent sort to the masses of France? Because from outside, he looks sort of like the elite candidate. Do people associate? him that way well, is that who people want I mean, to yeah, many, many 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 people do but you know macron uh 
people to a large extent, you know, I mean, some people do, but most people are going to vote for Macron uh, in the second round are not going to vote for Macron. They're going to vote against Le Pen, which is not the same thing. Okay. Uh, He's just a placeholder. And, he's just not and the evil person. He, he doesn't, you know, yeah, he is perceived as the elite thing, but he's also perceived as not being Le Pen, you know, which is the primary, the primary reason why people voted for him in the second round or are going to vote for him in the second round. So Le Pen round. is seen as sort um, of the person, the person of, uh, you know, low class, racist, uh, uneducated yeah, but basically, people. Yeah, ex exactly. And an extremist, you know, an extremist. And so all of those people, so yeah, here's something that happens all the time, you know, that you an experience I've had several times and that many people have talked about this to many people and they've had similar experiences is that you talk, for instance, to an old person in France, her grandmother, and you talk to her about immigration and she starts saying stuff that Le Pen would not never say. But when I say would never say, I don't mean would never say publicly. I mean, she would, she doesn't even think that's stuff that radical. Like she, they're, they're, they're like a thousand times more racist than Le Pen is. So as they say that stuff, you know, racist, I think it's a, uh, misnomer here but you know what i mean and so um so they say that stuff and then you're like oh so you're gonna vote for le pen and they look at you genuinely horrified that you would suggest such a thing you know <laughs> me voting for le pen i will never do that i'm not i'm not an extremist you know only fascists vote for le pen you know this is something we just explained to you that if she had her way She'd send back all the immigrants and her descendants, you know, and like, if it doesn't work, we may have to kill some, you know, I'm exaggerating, but it's something like that, you know, not, not that much. So that's what I mean when I say that people vote primarily not based on ideology, but based on which kind of social groups, who as a person and a social group they identify with and how they perceive that someone, that kind of person votes, you know, and they don't perceive themselves as extremists. But they perceive the Le Pen vote so as an extremist it's, it's vote. A, it's a Le Pen name. It's just a poison brand. And this was the hope of, this was the, I think, the promise that the right saw in Zamor, and maybe the reason yeah. why Zamor might have a better future in politics. Uh, so, okay, this is interesting. So, yeah, you're right that this was the premise. And he was right about this. The Le Pen name is a poison pill. It's like, that's what, you know, I joked after the first round, like, you know, five minutes after the results of the first round, I made the tweet where I said, what you need to know about the second round of a French election is that it's a contest between two people. And at the end, the one whose name is not Le Pen wins. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, and this is true, you know, this is true. And so, uh, Zemmour's calculation was that we need to get rid, um, of, of, of Le Pen and the National Front because the anti-immigration cause will never win as long as it's represented by this party and, and even more so by someone called the Ben. And he was right about this. He was absolutely right. Now, um, one thing I was actually wrong about in, in that uh, piece I wrote for CSPI in, uh, in, um, in December is um, at the time I'm, I, I agreed with his calculation that he could do better. But uh, like sometime in January, uh, you know, so I said he had, if he made it to the second round, like conditional on making it to the second round, I gave him something like a 30% chance, I think, of, of winning the second round. And now I realize that he also had no chance of winning the second round because the, the propaganda campaign against him uh, at the end of last year was something I'd never, I'd not seen since the time of Le Pen's, the elder, you know, the Marine Le Pen's father. And and it was very damaging. Like, they really hurt him badly. Uh, and, you know, I don't think he would have prevented him necessarily of reaching the second round because, like I said, without the war, I think he may have been able to do that. But I think he would have had no chance in the second round for that reason because they managed to, they managed to stick on him this label of an extremist. And once you have this label, you cannot win the second round of a French presidential election. It's impossible. Because most people don't identify, you know, at least for now, it may change in like 15 years because it's, it's pretty striking when you look at the, the polls for about the second round and you look at Le Pen's score by age, by age group. One of the most striking thing is that she's almost neck and neck with Macron among people who are in the 35 to, uh, uh, 49 age group. And that's my generation. I'm 47. I'm, I'm 37. Uh, 35, not 40, 35 to 50. And so I'm 37 and I'm the generation of people who were in the street in 2002 
when Le Pen the Elder, I mean, I wasn't in the streets, but people in my generation, my generation were, they were in the streets in 2002 when her father reached, it was the first time that the National Front reached the second round, and it was a huge shock, you know. Uh, there was those huge protests. I mean, protests that you have, that, you know, that don't exist in the U.S. is something that's just, that was absolutely gigantic. And those people, so those people voted at the time massively, massively against, um, uh, you know, against Le Pen. And no, she's neck and neck. Her do his daughter, he was, you know, it was Le Pen the father at the time. His daughter is neck and neck with Macron in the, in this cohort. So of course, you know, people age. And as they age, they become more right wing. But this cannot explain, you know, it doesn't even explain most of the effect here. Like there is actually a cohort effect. Like really, people at the same age uh, in 2002 also voted massively against Le Pen. Uh, so there's really something that's changing here. And, you know, who knows? Maybe, you know, it, it's very possible that in 15 years, things will be very different. But 15 years is a long time. Um, so, so, so the, in the 2020, there was, um, it was interesting because it wasn't the age, uh, gradient wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, um, you know, it wasn't a, uh, uh, it was, it was the U S it wasn't as simple as older people like Trump, like, cause the old people actually were uh, polling a little bit better for, uh, for Biden. Um, I think I saw polls where they were, you know, he was doing best with like 65 plus and, you know, the youngest people were also very pro Biden. And then the middle, that same sort of age group, 35, you know, to 50, say generation X, well, you know, sort of uh, age group. Uh, they were, the, I think they were, you know, probably the most pro Trump or, or close to the uh, most pro Trump. Um, the old people is interesting because I think that they watch a lot of TV. I think they get their, a lot of their news from TV. I saw some poll on in the U.S. about Russia versus Ukraine, and the old people were the most hawkish um, about you know supporting Ukraine and against Russia by by a lot. And my my theory of this, okay, some people say, oh, they're just nostalgic for the Cold War. They remember the Cold War. I, yeah, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I think it's just they watch a lot of TV. Um, they don't get a lot of internet. And TV is, you know, completely, you know, completely, you know, the establishment representing the establishment foreign policy. While if you go on Twitter or you go somewhere else, it's, uh, you know, Facebook, it's, it's, it's more, um, you know, it's more, uh, uh, you know, it's more sort of balanced, even though Twitter can be crazy on, on the Russian Ukraine thing. It's not like TV. TV is just, you know, completely, uh, you know, in, the, in line with the American uh, foreign policy establishment. Um, so, you know, maybe there's something else going on here. Maybe as people old get older um you know those generations that get their news from the tv they they die off um you know people like you know the, the media might have less control you know as we move to a world where the you know the people most of us who just grew up with the internet and the internet is most of what we interact with as far as getting our news you know we become everybody and then i think you know the establishment doesn't really have as much advantage anymore does does that make sense to you yeah yeah no i think that something like that may be going on because you know Definitely the reason, one of the main reasons, you know, there are two main reasons, in my opinion, why Le Pen does so poorly among older people. One that I meant, I mean, I mentioned both of them earlier, but I can, it's, I think it's uh, useful here to, to uh, repeat that. One of them is that, as I said before, they're really scared of our economic policies because they're scared of the instability it might create. And as pensioners, you know, they, they don't want inst instability is the last thing they want. Uh, they're pretty good the way they are. That's one reason. Another reason is that, those are people who watch TV. All of their information comes from TV and they've been watching TV for decades. And so it's been like bashing to their head that Le Pen is, is the devil, etc. And, and they really trust that stuff more, much more, you know, or even if they don't trust, uh, trust it that much, which, you know, given how low trust in media is in, in France, even those guys probably don't trust it that much. But it doesn't matter. As I said it before, you may not trust it, but if you're exposed to it constantly, it still has an effect on what you think, you know, whether you realize it or not. And so it's true, you know, that maybe the explanation, because like people my generation, so, you know, I'm like an older millennial uh, and uh, in my cohort, uh, Le Pen is neck and neck with uh, Macron. And we get, you know, I, I've, I haven't watched TV and I don't even remember the last time I watched TV, you know, but I, when I go to my parents, like they're the TV is constantly on, you know, it's like it's a completely different world and people are younger you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the Gen Z, uh, generation, um, like it, I think it's even less, it's even more true. Like, uh, they get even more of their information. I think they don't get much information or anything, but uh, to the extent that they do, it's from the internet. And, and if you look at the posts, Le Pen actually does even better among those guys. So that's a really freaky thing, you know, from an American perspective is that the far right candidates 
actually does a better score among the younger people. And, mm. and but I think, you know, it seems like a, a paradox, you know, and like completely different. But I actually think that you're right, that in a way, even though it the end result is very different, the mechanism is the same. It's TV versus the internet. You know? yeah. And then I think well, I, I think, I, yeah, I think, I think that's are, one of the mechanisms. Yeah. So I think the young people in America, maybe they like Biden more than Trump, they would have, but they would have gone for Sanders, uh, you know, over Biden. Yeah. And they did in the primaries. Um, so yeah, I think I think I think that's I think TV watching is, you know, the medium of communication is important. And that, you know, it's it's not like there's a iron law of politics. I mean, one thing that's useful of looking at France, looking at other countries, is if you're American, you think it's the, there's an iron law of politics that things always become more liberal and the younger generation is always m more liberal than the older generation. And you could just look around the world a little bit and you can see, okay, that's not that's not necessarily true. There's some places where actually, you know, the older, the younger, younger people can. So it's not some iron law of development or iron law of civilization yeah. or Western democracy uh, or something. Um, it's it's contingent that different countries have, you know, sort of different things going on. Although some of the things like TV versus internet, I mean, that's affecting that's affecting all of us. Um, okay. It's even affecting Russia. It's even affecting Russia. It was very interesting to see this poll coming out of Russia, like a, a few few days ago, a few weeks ago. Um, that that showed that uh, the support for the war among Russians, you know, was uh, strongly dependent on how much TV people were watching. You know, how much they were watching TV versus getting their information from the internet. It was really striking. So this is a global phenomenon, but depending on the local political context, it has it can have very different, you know, uh, consequences. And like in France, one of I think one of the again, you know, I'm not saying it's the only reason. There is also the uh, economic policy issue. That's at play here, and the the fear of old people of losing their pensions, but uh, uh, but you know that's certainly it's it's uh, it's something that I think is uh, actually yeah. important. So um, okay, so the, yeah, that's so we're uh, we're upon the election. You know, presumably Macron is gonna uh, win his second term. There's term limits in France; he can't win a third term, or can he? No, he can't. Yeah, there is. Um, okay, there was so a constitutional. There was a constitutional revision in two thousand eight. The Sarkozy who did that, and so he can't get a second round. But he may actually. So he talked about maybe uh, revising the constitution. Not so that I don't think he's going to run for a third. You know, we're not Russia, so this is not going to happen. But um, and I don't even think he wants to. You know, uh, you know. But uh, I mean, he, he may have wanted to if there wasn't this constitutional limitation. But there is, and he's not going to change it just for him. But actually, he may change the constitution, uh, not not for him, but because um, uh, he wants to change the term limits. You know, so the 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 duration of it of a term. You know, right now it's five years. It used to be seven years. It was changed in two thousand. In two thousand, uh, it was reduced to five years. And for various reasons, I'm going to spare spare you. Um, a lot of people have rightly complained about this in the past. And so Le Pen, for instance, is also proposing that it be brought to seven, but non-renewable. And I actually think this would probably be good. Um, I'm not sure. And, one, and, and, one, Macron, yeah. and Macron, said, Macron, Macron said that he was interested by the idea and that he might do a referendum, although um, he doesn't like referendum very much. So I doubt he will. But he may, he may actually pro uh, offer to do, propose to do this and to leave it up to the French people by referendum to decide whether uh, it's going to be renewable or not. But he he won't be able to run again. Um, it, it's going to be, you know, I, it's hard to say what's going to happen. Would, would, but he extend, would he extend his own term to seven years or no? That would go in effect after No, 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 no. He would not, he would not do that. No, he would, uh, a lot of people joked about that or some people actually thought he was going to do this. But no, I don't think he's going to do this. Uh, no, he would just, uh, it would be for the next president, basically. Uh but um, so he's 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 gonna be back for another five years, and it's gonna be, you know, it, it he won't he's gonna win very easily in the end. But uh, it doesn't mean that his next term is gonna be very easy for him. Uh, it's you know it's tricky because again you know remember that he's in the end he's he's gonna be elected by there's maybe like twenty five percent of the people who really like him. Uh, it's like his base of, and pretty much everybody else hates him. And even though the constitution gives him all the powers he needs formally to govern for five years, despite having such a weak base, 
because he's going to have a strong majority in the because of the way our electoral system works. He's going to get a strong majority in June at the in the assembly. Uh, and you know he has also he has other powers like he can dissolve the parliament, whereas the the parliament cannot like, or at least it's virtually impossible for the parliament to remove him. So he has these threats that he can always use against the parliament to force the parliament to do what he wants. Uh, so formally, legally, constitutionally, he has all the powers to be basically a dictator. Like France is the closest thing to a dictatorship in any Western democracy you can find. Like the French president is much more powerful than the American president. Like the American president has to deal with Congress, and Congress actually matters a lot. The French president, he doesn't have to, the parliament. He, he can basically does do what he wants, you know. And with parliaments, he can always threaten to dissolve with dissolving them, and they're going to do what he wants, and they always do. Uh, uh, you know, the parliament in France is basically just as uh, independent uh, from the president as the parliament in Russia is, really, and. Um, but so, you know, again, legally, constitutionally, he has all the powers. But at the end of the day, his, his real base is something like 25% of the population. And in a democracy, um, because, you know, even though I just say that about the parliament, this comparison of Russia, we're not Russia. And so in a democracy, it's very difficult to govern, to do what you want, when you only have really 25% of the population that's really backing you. So another problem is that there's not going to be any elections in France until 2026. There's going to be four years without any election. Elections are a way of, for people to blow off some steam, you know, and to send a message to the government when something is not going the right way. When they can't send that message, they have to find another way to express their discontents. And you get something like the yellow vest, you know. So uh, if you add to this the uh, inflation, that's creeping up and from which France so far has been protected because before the election, you know, Macron, as I said, has basically poured, you know, spent a lot of government money to protect people, to shield people from inflation, but he's not going to be able, this costs a lot of money and he's not going to be able to do that forever. So we're going to have, you know, inflation is, is go, it's already increased, even though we've been more shielded from it uh, than other European countries and than the U S but it's going to increase. So if you have, you know, if you put into all of this in, in the, the equation, you have on the one hand a president who is only really supported by 25% of the population. You have no election that people can use to send a message until 2026. And you have like economic troubles coming. Um, you know, you don't know. I mean, it, it may also be that he's going to sell and like have a pretty uneventful second term, you know, that's a possibility, but that's not the only possibility. And uh, he, he should be, you know, he, he should really think about this. Like, you know, they, there is a possibility, which is that he's going to suffer from a bad case of hubris uh, after this election because he he's going to have all the powers, you know, he's going to... What does he, what does he spend term. the political capital he has? What does he spend it on? What, what drives this man? Well, he's going to... Well, one thing he's going to do is do is uh, that's going to be tricky. Is a reform of the pension system. It's going to extend the 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 amount of time during which people have to pay into the system to be allowed to retire with like a full pension. And and this is, is going to be very unpopular. And so this may be the thing. You know, you you never know. Look, nobody would have guessed that the this small uh, carbon tax would have been the would be the thing that uh, um, you know would be the sparkle that that gives rise to the yellow vest movement so who knows but this the pension reform may actually be the thing that uh, makes everything explode you know you, you don't know or maybe maybe if he does it you know if he does it quickly enough he can actually do it before people have it, the time to you know think about it and like uh, you still be he won't have a we call that a grace period in in France or an état de grâce um where right after the election, usually you have like a, a few months where you can do be, pretty much based anything you want uh, because you have this big mandate and even people who don't vote it for you, they basically let you do whatever you want. Uh, Macron didn't really have that in 2017 because he was elected by default. And the thing is that he's all again going to be elected by default this time. So I don't think he's really going to have that. But he, he's going to have like a little bit of that, but really not that much.
So how about the uh, how about the anti bit, yeah how about the uh, how about the anti wokeness stuff? There, there's a, the Macron and people close to him and the government have been talking about that. Is that something they're serious about, or is it is it more rhetoric? It is, you know. I, I don't. I think Macron. Well, Macron. Is, you know, this is something that this is another thing that people outside of France have trouble understanding, because you know it's you, you get a lot of those statements. You know that, and that's what people in the U.S. are going to hear. You get those statements from Macron that make him sound like he's really. <clears throat> serious about fighting wokeness, for instance. But, you know, you could find just as many statements where he's kind of like apparently supporting wokeness or, you know, other aspects of, of wokeness. Macron ideologically is all over the place, which means that he's nowhere. Like, he will say completely inconsistent things at different times or, you know, to different people. He doesn't really, and, you know, it's, it's really too... I'm not even joking. Like, I don't even think he knows where he is. Really. Like, he doesn't... Um, he, he has, like, everything in his head. In, but, you know, I'm, I have no doubt that when he says something, at the moment he says it, he really believes it. But then five minutes later, he's going to say something completely inconsistent with it. And he's also going to completely believe it. You know? in, in some ways, in more ways than one, he's much more than Trump, like Trump, than people realize, I think. And this is one of the ways in which he's more like Trump than people realize. And so, um, but, you know, on the other hand, this walk stuff, it's less of a thing in France than it is in the U.S. So I don't think it will matter all that much. You know, it's, it's becoming more and more of a thing because we're importing it. And even though France is more resistant to it than the U.S., uh, we have the same phenomenon where, um, you know, people, young journalists, young people in academia... Uh, get into this, and of course, this end up um, um, being reflected, you know, in the the, the larger culture. But uh, there's more resistance in the larger culture, and I don't, you know, I seriously doubt that this is going to be a big issue in Macron's second term. Also, one of the reasons I don't think it's going to be a big issue is that even though he says, you know, he's going to be sometimes saying some walk stuff. Um, Macron fundamentally is not into that stuff. I mean, like I said, he's not really into anything in particular, but uh, he's not going to become some... And, you know, and, and similarly, there are no people in his... In his party, you have plenty of people also... You know, like, basically, the people in his party and himself, they're like caricatures of people who went to business school. Uh, so they're not people who have who know much about politics and ideology. They're not ideologues. They don't know much about that stuff. You know, they don't read much. Um, they're like the they're like vulgarians, but high income and with like a, a often a prestigious degree, but not the kind of degree that you need to know a lot about. You know, culture and ideology and politics to to get. Um, you know, it's like a business school degree, that sort of thing. And so, uh, they they know, you know, they're they're gonna they're gonna absorb that stuff to the extent that it's part of the culture of the elite. But they're never gonna be like true believers or gonna push very hard for that stuff. You know, they're gonna do it because that's what something someone like them does. You know, uh, so they're gonna go go along with the slogans, you know, all that stuff. But they won't be like they're not true believers. You know, uh. So I don't think I don't think they're gonna. This is gonna be a. I don't think it's gonna be a major issue. I don't think like the culture war in France is gonna focus on that, like in the U.S. It's it's, it's gonna be the always. same thing as always. It's gonna it's gonna be Islam, you know, Islam, the veil, um, yeah. you know, immigration. Uh, yeah, there's gonna be stuff in education, you know. So that's perhaps the closest thing we have to the 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 American culture war. But other than that, you know, the we have a culture war here too, but it, uh, you know, it's it's uh, the the themes are very different. Yeah, and uh, well, they're, in, they're, in, they're think... interesting because the, the 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 because it's Islam is sort of the conservative force, right? Um, and, you know, in the sense that the the criticism of Islam is that oh, it's not nice to women and this and that, um, and it's you know not too uh, religious and not secular enough, right? So it's it's different than the American thing. It's 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 a um, where it's like you know the socially conservative people are on the right and they're fighting basically other white people. So it does seem it is more sort of close to a racial thing 
uh, or like a deep cultural yeah, thing in yeah, France it's, you know, than it's, it is it's, in America. It's very, it's very hypocritical. So I have a theory about this. And I say a theory, but I'm like 100% sure it's true, actually. So I, I use theory in, not in the sense that it's like some kind of wild hypothesis or anything. But, um, you have a lot of people in France, including on the left, who are more part of the universalist left-wing tradition, who also criticize the, the veil. And, and, you know, the right in France has been totally um, um, absorbed, you know, has totally absorbed these ideologies, this kind of universalist, you know, uh, human rights stuff, you know, equality stuff, uh, discourse. Uh, this has been totally, the, the left has totally won the culture war like several decades ago on this in France. And so the right has kind of like uh, incorporated all that stuff. So you have people on both the left and the right who focus so much on stuff like the veil, for instance, which is, if you ask me, the most stupid debate, debate ever. Uh, but my theory is that when they're talking about the veil, they're not really talking about the veil. Yeah. Like the veil is a way to talk about immigration and to be anti-immigration without saying and even realizing that you're anti-immigration. Because it's politically incorrect to say that you don't want more immigration because you want France to say the way it is and you don't want people who are not like us, you know, to change the culture, etc. This is not something that most people this are comfortable is not, this saying. This is not unique to France. This is America too. The anti-immigration people will talk about, oh, I don't care if they come as long as they come yeah. legally. That's about legality. Or it's about yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that, no, that, no, no, that, that, that's right. But, but in France, it has this outlet where this kind of energy finds an outlet in this because we have this whole discourse about the Republican values and, you know, the veil and the equality and stuff. And so the veil is this thing that people seize because it's a way for them to really oppose what they're doing. Really, they're opposing the consequences of immigration. But look, if, you, if you're going to be a liberal country and France is not going to stop being that anytime soon, you're not going to, what are you going to do? You know, like you're, I mean, you know, Zemmour and Le Pen proposed that, but it was never going to. It's not yeah, find people realistic, for, yeah, you know, find women for to ban to ban the veil from the street. Where well, you're gonna f you're gonna find people. You know, you know, we can't even send cops in some high immigration areas anymore because they need to send a whole army to get in there. And people are saying that they're gonna force them to remove their veil. That's <laughs> ridiculous. You know, it's just like this kind of nonsense that people say, but nobody can seriously believe it. But um, but people use this stuff, and you know, even people who don't go as far. People obsess over the veil, and and really. Because, you know, they don't want to face the truth, which is that they're uncomfortable with the cultural changes that have been brought about by immigration. They're uncomfortable. With it. When I say they're not comfortable the saying veil, that, the I don't just mean... Culture. The veil is one of the cultural changes, though, right? You see women yeah, covering of course, their of heads, Yeah, right? of course. Of course. But they don't want to... But they're, they, what they're going to say, they're going to say, I, oh, no, I, I don't care about the fact that you're Muslim, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's it's fine as long as you know you have to do the, you, the right you, stuff. You know, as long as you believe in equality of sexes, you can pray five times exactly. a day, and you can eat different food, and you can look different, right? No, but actually, they're also uncomfortable with the praying five times a no, day. No, I know, thing, but you know, but, like, but, but but it's it's harder to talk about that, right? Because yeah, 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 I uh, know. So, but you know, so they're gonna say, yeah, I mean, you can be a Muslim as long as you don't pray at work, which means that you don't pray five times a day <laughs> at the regular hours because it's impossible if you work. Uh, you can be a Muslim if you don't wear the veil. You can be a Muslim if you're like basically a, a leftist on gender relation, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, you know, so basically you can't be a Muslim, you know. Um, but, uh, but of course they're not gonna, when I say again, when I say they're not comfortable saying that, I don't just mean that they're not comfortable saying it publicly, oh, yeah. but that privately they would say it or they, no, no, even to themselves they won't admit it. But but in France we have we have used the veil as this big issue because we ha we have we have uh, this history of laicite where we have a very aggressive type of secularism and so people have been able to lash onto this to fight immigration without fighting immigration and and, and so that's the reason why this thing has become such a big thing it's 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 all because people don't want to have the real debate. And, and so they're talking about that stuff. Uh, and it's both on the right and the left, you know, because again, lots of people on the left, lots of people on the left would say things about Islam, etc. that if a Republican said that in, in the US, like they would be in big trouble, you know, it would, it would be a huge outrage. There would be a huge outrage. Yeah. So, okay. It, now, it doesn't mean they're babies or anything, you know, it just, 
it's the opposite of that. They're talking about that stuff because they don't want to have the real debate. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, that's all interesting. So we know because of your analysis that uh, Macron is going to uh, win in two days from now. Um, what is, um, if you, when you're watching the election, uh, what, 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 uh, you know, questions are still in the air. Like what, what, um, you know, you know, he's going to win, he's going to win by 10 points, you say, or something like that. Uh, are you, you know, watching a certain region or a certain demographic class, you know, relative to expectations, like what's interesting, what could we be looking for besides, you know, Macron's going to obviously win. To, to be honest, not, not much. Like, uh, I mean, we already know, you know, we already know, that she's not only going to lose, but lose badly. We know that she's going to lose mainly because of old people. We know which regions are going to vote for her and which region are going to vote against her. We know that education is going to be highly predictive of the vote for her or vote for Macron. Um, so I don't think anything about the, the election results. You know, I'm thinking at the very local level, it's going to be interesting. One thing that's going to be interesting is to see, okay, here's one thing that's going to be interesting is to see how, so there was this big chunk of the electorate that used to vote for the Republicans, and now the Republican Party is dead. It's dead. Like, she she didn't reach the threshold that she needed to reach for the party to get reimbursed the, its expenditure. So the party, I mean, it's not going to, it's gonna not going to die, you know, disappear, but as a major, uh, you know, as a major player in national politics, it's over. Um Saying the Socialist Party had been killed the last time, and this is the time of the Republican Party. So what's going to be interesting is to see how where those votes went exactly and where, you know, in, uh, in what area. So it's going to be interesting to watch. And, you know, I think what's pretty clear already is that most of it is going to go to Macron. So really, we have this remarkable situation where Macron, who would never have been elected, had it not been for an extraordinary, you know, uh, conjunction of accidents in 2016, 2017, like Fillon having his legal troubles and, uh, the Socialist Party doing a primary where they elect Amon, who was a far left, you know, to the left, the left of the party, which opened a whole avenue for Macron to, uh, to get votes. Um, uh, all sorts of accidents. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that was foretold. Like, you know, the, in most possible worlds, Macron does like uh, 8% in 2017 and we never hear from him again. Or, you know, in, in most possible worlds, actually, he doesn't even run in 2017 because there was a, whole, a, a lot of other things that needed to happen before he could run. But, you know, he did run and he did win and he killed the Socialist Party when this happened. And now he just killed the Republican Party. And we have a situation that's really remarkable because we have those two parties that used to govern France alternatively for like 40 years. And though they're both completely dead, at least at the national level, what's interesting is that they continue to hold like uh, town halls, etc. A lot of local, they still have a lot of local power, but this doesn't translate into national power. And they're going to die a slow death, keeping like local power for several decades, probably until, you know, and, and goes away. But you have the situation, so they practically disappeared at the national level, and now you have Macron created, again, through a series of accidents, created this new political force that's basically uh, the center-right that used to be, the, the, the centrist that used to be in the Republican Party and the centrists that used to be in the Socialist Party. Uh, but in fact, he moved to the right now, so he's got mostly all of the, so the Republican Party now, he got all of the votes or most of the votes from the Republican Party. So it's it's the new Macron is the new Republican Party, except that he added to this the center left, the centrist of the Socialist Party. So he's created this new poll that's like the most of the Republican Party plus the right wing of the Socialist Party. And this is again, this is something that was not, you know, I'm not saying there are there are not like structural factors that made it possible. But they made it possible. They didn't make they didn't make it necessary, or even likely. Like eight years ago, this was not likely at all. In fact, it was everybody would have laughed if you had made that prediction. And, and so, he's in a very good position again. You know, putting aside 
the non-electoral issues, like I said, he may be facing social movements and social unrest because, you know, at the end of the day, as I said before, his, his base is still pretty weak. <laughs> and so he's going to, and he's going to have a problem with this, or he may have a problem with this, but, um, but politically, given the way our institutions work, given the way that in order to, to be essentially a dictator, at least legally, <clears throat> You just need to have, like, if you can reliably get 25% of the votes in the first round and you're not labeled an extremist and you're facing someone who is, then you can be a dictator. You, you only have 25% of, of people who are really is behind Penn, you. Is Pen going to be around for 30 more years, advancing to the second round and then losing? Le Pen, uh, you know, Le Pen, I think she doesn't like politics. Uh -huh. uh, is Le that Pen, right? I think I, I, th I think she will be around next time again, um, which, you know, is to me is a real tragedy here. But um, she's going to be around. But, but my, my theory of Le Pen, which is based on talking to people who know people in our entourage, so this is not like, you know, this, this actually has some pretty solid ground. You know, it's not, I'm just not, I'm not just like doing wild conjectures here. Uh, Le Pen doesn't like politics like the way her father did. Her father was a political animal. He, f he loved this stuff. You know, he really lived for this. Uh, and she's not like this. She doesn't love this stuff. She'd be much happier if she could do, if she could be a lawyer again, probably. But she can't, you know, she's burnt. Uh, and even more importantly, even if it were just, if it were just her, I think she would quit. She would stop. She would quit politics. But what you have to understand is that a lot of people around her some of her advisors, some people in her party, literally depend on her running to make a living. Because those are people who have absolutely no skills whatsoever. Like this party, you have to understand, it's a cult, basically. It's mm -hmm. run like a cult. You know, it's like this small yeah. like family company where the boss you know, make all the decisions. But around the boss, you have this whole ecosystem of people who have no skills whatsoever. They're pretty stupid people. Uh, they can't do anything else. At least they can't do anything else and maintain the kind of like standard of life that they have right now. So they're putting a lot of, she's under a lot of pressure from those guys not to quit. Because if she quits, it's not just her, you know, her, she'll be fine. You know, she's not stupid. I mean, she's not the sharpest tool in the shed, but she's not stupid. Uh, those guys really are. And, and they depend on her. So they put her under a lot of pressure not to quit. And, and so you have this situation where, yeah, where you're going to, which is really bad for the country and for the right because, you know, we have this situation where the only uh, contender, you know, I, one of the reasons I, I really liked uh, Zemo's candidacy, I mean, the main reason is that I wanted to break this curse. You know. We need to have find a way to get rid of Le Pen and the National Front because this is a guarantee as long as those guys are the opposition that centuries like Macron will always win. And, and so, um, but the problem is that it's not going to happen, at least not this time, because, uh, because you know, like I said, Zemmour wasn't going to win the second round. But he didn't need to win the second round to, to destroy the National Front, the National the Rassemblement National, no, the National Rally. It's a new name, um, the party of Le Pen. He just needed to beat her in the first round and to be in the second round. This would have been the end of the national, of the, of her party. That would have been enough, you know. But it didn't happen. So she's going to be around and again, even though she doesn't really want to. That's So that's the irony of this whole thing. She doesn't really want to. And she's screwing the right. But she's going to do it anyway because there are too many people who depend on her to live. And so they're going to keep making sure that she stays in the game, you know, even though she doesn't really want to be in the game. Yeah. Inter that's interesting. So what I'm hearing, okay. So so what I'm hearing from you as far as uh, France's immediate term future at Le Pen's presidency is basically a, a country run by a dictator for five years, uh, who has no real base and nobody who likes him, uh, but with powerful social, uh, you know, social forces sort of bubbling beneath the surface. And so that that seems like a recipe for for instability in the next in the next five years. Yeah, it's gonna dip, you know, it depends also on because, like I said, when I say Macron is a dictator, like any French president is a dictator, of course, it I mean that legally, constitutionally, sure, it doesn't no. mean that he's going to try and exercise the powers of a dictator. He, you know, 
if you have a strong enough base, you can, you know, the goal could, could, um, I mean, Mitterrand could, you know, at some point, uh, Chirac, I mean, like most, M Macron is different. He doesn't have a strong enough base. Um, but, um, but if he tries, yeah, sure, it could, it could be, it could mean trouble, you know, uh, it, it could work, you know, it depends on what he does. Look, I think those things, it's very difficult to predict, you know, like I said before, the yellow vest, nobody would have predicted that this in insignificant carbon tax would start this huge movement that, you know, I mean, Macron was, that was big, you know, Macron really, if you looked at his face during the yellow, at the peak of the height of the yellow vest movement, he looked ch physically changed. Like he was scared. He was literally scared. You know, at one point he went to visit um, a prefecture, you know, an administrative building that had been burned down in the middle of nowhere in France. Now, let me tell you, like when a sous prefecture burns in France in the middle of nowhere in a rural area, you're a president, you should be scared because it's not normal. Those guys, they don't burn shit down usually. When they do, it means that something really wrong is happening. And so he was scared. He went there. He had to run away. Literally, he was run. He was run down the streets. You know, he had to s run to his car and like the car like left in a hurry uh, as he was being verbally abused by people. Like, you know, uh, of course, he forgot that. Though. I don't think he forgot completely, but he was really scared. And then he didn't leave his palace for like a <laughs> month or something. He was really scared. He was, I mean, I'm, what I mean scared, I mean scared, you know, like, you know, he wasn't sure what was going to happen. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, but nobody would have predicted that this would be sparked, you know, by uh, this insignificant carbon tax. And, and in other cases, he did things where a lot of people predicted, like there was a change of the legislation on labor that a lot of people predicted would create like huge social unrest, but it just, there was no problem. So it's, it's very difficult, but what I'm saying is just yeah, you have you have all the you know all the elements are there to create something like this. So you should like thread carefully, and I don't know if he's going to. You know, it depends on how aware he is of that stuff. You know, and it's unclear and how much how susceptible he is to Ubris after after the election. So we'll see. But um, how susceptible um, he is to what? Uh, Ubris. Hubris? Um, hubris, yeah. I'm not sure you pronounce it in H U B R I S? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so, um, um, so I, I don't know, you know, I, I mean, uh, I, just, I think, you know, we've reached a situation which I think is democratically very bad because you have this situation where, again, it's as I described before, to, you know, it's enough to be able to reliably get 25% of the vote in the first round. And as long as your position is labeled an extremist, you you know you can be elected again and have the powers of the of a dictator. And especially in a country like France, uh, th this is a recipe for for bad stuff happening. And and also it's not a recipe for you know we in what sense is this even a democracy? Really? I mean you know we're we're being governed by a guy who is going to do stuff that's going to be opposed by the vast majority of the country all the time, you know. But because he has the right kind of constitutional power, he can do it, as long as, you know, it doesn't create something like the Yellow Vest movement that forces him to to go back, you know, and like and then start, like, uh, quitting everything and, like, pouring money, giving money to everyone in the hope that they won't, like, cut his head off or something. <laughs> uh, which is what happened, you know, when, during the Yellow Vest movement. So... Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's not, it's, it's as, you know, yeah, it's a recipe for instability. It's not democratically healthy. So I think we're having a real problem. You know, Americans complain about, and I think with good reasons, uh, about the state of their, uh, you know, of their politics and uh, institutions. And, you know, we have uh, different problems, but they're just as serious. And, and of course, you, you, you observe similar things in much of, of the West, you know, not all, not all Western countries, but uh, France, the UK, and the US are, of course, the three like main, you know, for symbolic, you know, military political reasons, the main Western countries, and they're also the ones of the the most dysfunctional politics. And yeah, we, we you know, for in very different ways, for very different reasons, or sometimes similar, but often very different. And uh, I don't know, you know, we really need to do something about this, I think, because I don't know 
how's this gonna I don't think it's gonna go on forever you know at some point something's gonna break and I, I don't know when or what or how but uh, this is this is a bad situation we need to to think more about it <laughs> okay and on that positive note uh, we'll be watching Sunday and um, uh, when this comes out you'll either look like a genius or this whole conversation will be uh, yeah I, mean, I don't uh, think when, study, when the, even, the, even where the odds are right now I, I don't think I look like a genius but uh, but I also know I won't look like a fool which is yeah. probably the most important thing <laughs> <laughs> okay Th thanks Philippe thanks